I was in third grade when I saw the Happy Days Thanksgiving episode, and I loved it. The whole cast was in pilgrim costumes, so that was great. Joni Cunningham complains that being a pilgrim sure is a dragoth. And the fawn says things like, Greta the Mundo. <laughs> Not to brag, but by third grade, I was a veteran of four Thanksgiving pageants and considered myself to be something of a Mayflower expert. Or so I thought up until the moment Joni leaves the room and her goody-goody brother Richie asks, Father, are you letting her go out like that? Have you seen her skirt? It's up to her ankles. I remember sitting there and watching that and realizing for the first of many times, oh, maybe the people who founded this country were kind of crazy. <laughs> there are actually a surprising number of sitcoms that have done episodes set in 17th century New England, even though 17th century New England is all situation and no comedy. <laughs> Turkey time is festive time. The family's all together. Cranberry sauce, delicious stuffing. Yeah, when they cram the stuffing in the turkey real tight, it's paradise for us giants, right, Salmonella? Mm, right, and after dinner when they forget the USDA poultry inspector's advice and they leave the stuffing inside the turkey even when it's refrigerated, <laughs> I, Salmonella, will be there. Yeah, and then us giants will have our festivities. Mm, putting a time bomb in somebody's tummy. You know, I really like Thanksgiving. A lot. I do have some fears, though, that one day it will be a rare thing people do. I get that traveling twice a year, only four weeks apart, is a big hassle, and families can be a real trial on your mental health. Parents make you obligated to them. Not right, in my opinion. But of course, you are entitled to do on your day off work, except for the poor retail workers who have to totally miss the holiday for the past couple years, you can do anything you want. You can have dinner with your roommates, for your friends, for the family you have chosen. You aren't obligated. Unless this sort of thing will destroy some relationships for years, and I suppose it might. At that point, you have to come up with a really good excuse. Say you have to work or you'll get fired, it's sort of Black Friday thing. I have to say, my very best Thanksgivings were actually spent with friends. I was invited to the home of a modern soul food chef. She made the best food. Thanksgiving had a little kick to it that year. There were lots of friends there, people I didn't know, people I knew. We played this game called um, Dictionary, or Balderdash, I guess, and I wiped the floor with everyone. Maybe that's why I enjoyed it so much, I don't know. And it only takes one really good Thanksgiving to tell your brain that you remember Thanksgiving being really good. I hear people complain about the fact that the shops skip Thanksgiving and go straight from Halloween to Christmas. I don't mind at all. It's like Thanksgiving is the sweet, simple, secret thing. One meal, any kind you want, except that you can get a gigantic 24-pound turkey for about seven bucks or free with a $150 grocery store purchase. And don't freak out because that bird is about the easiest thing you can make on Thanksgiving. And everyone's going to make a fuss over it. They're always so jazzed about the moistness of it. That's like, you know, you, you cook it to not 180 degrees. You cook it to, you know, a lot less, like 160, maybe 50. Take it out, and then it finishes cooking on its own under a little foil. So that's how that works. You know, when they say they're jazzed about the moistness of it, though, those words are like $100 bills to me. And for Bob's sake, you don't have to decorate. Fully on buying decorations. Don't buy an eight-foot inflatable turkey for your yard. Same for Santa or Snoopy or someone like that. Thanksgiving is for trying another time to get the men in the kitchen without corporate interference, hopefully. It's not a commercial holiday. That's awesome, and I say that too to the folks in the stores. And they agree. Maybe I can get people to put the Christmas creep into perspective. Oh, and for Bob's sakes, don't go out shopping on Thanksgiving. 
None of that cheap stuff in the ads is any good. It's lower quality. Shop online in October and November. Split it up so you don't have to spend your rent. And remember, men can make sides, especially mashed potatoes. Let everyone cook their specialty. Don't sweat it. Ask for help. Make cooking part of the whole fun deal. Then rest, watch the Grinch, and then have pie. We, we have, have so, so many, many great, great things, things to be thankful, thankful for on Thanksgiving Day. The riches of a land in beauty alone. Its mountains, oceans, deserts, and cities are superb. We cannot look at all of these and not know that God is right here with us. Our thanksgiving blessings are great. We can raise our children to love our country, to read how the pilgrims came on the Mayflower to America, so we may live in freedom as we do. Our children can learn how our forefathers established the government, the constitution, the two-party system of America. Today the children can learn from television how the candidates for president and vice president are nominated. So we the people have the privilege of voting. Our thanksgiving blessings are great. There is no land which does more to help the less fortunate with benefits, hospitals, and other organizations. We are still a land of freedom where we have the chance to choose the line of work we wish to go into as our endeavor in life. We still have the freedom to worship in whatever faith we feel is right for us as individuals. We should count up blessings each day to know that this nation under God shall not perish from this earth. Our thanksgiving blessings are great.
Mayflower passenger William Bradford described the pilgrim's first few months after arriving in Plymouth in 1620. Being ye depth of winter, and wanting houses and other comforts, being infected with ye scurvy and other diseases, which this long voyage had brought upon them, there died sometimes two or three a day. Half of them died in the first year. Half. Starvation, lack of shelter, and this is appalling when you really think about it. These were people with the farming skills of Mr. Magoo. And if that weren't enough, they were religious zealots, so they believed they deserved every misfortune visited upon them. Because their beloved God apparently decided their lives should suck just a little bit more. If the Puritan episode is a sitcom staple, maybe because TV networks have to broadcast something on Thanksgiving. You know, everybody's working at top speed these days. The times demand the best we've got. And the best when it comes to coffee is measured in terms of flavor. The demands we place upon coffee today are greater than ever before. Every cup must measure up. Every sip must hit the spot. Now, not only to fill its all-important place as part of a good meal, but for the boost fine coffee gives, the lift to help you get things done. And besides that, since the shortage makes rationing necessary, each cup should make up in excellence for the cups we don't get in between. Now, to fill the bill and more than fill it, get Chase and Sanborn coffee. You'll marvel that a single cup can hold so much delicious flavor. The secret is that Chase and Sanborn is more than one coffee. It's the finer ones blended. And today, our experts are turning out the richest, most satisfying, most flavorful blend of our entire history. You want all the flavor you can get, so get all the flavor you can. Every time you part with a precious ration coupon, ask for Chase and Sanborn. Naturally, nowadays, with so many others buying Chase and Sanborn, too, your grocer may sometimes run out. If he should, please understand and cooperate. And the next time, be sure to ask again for Chase and Sanborn coffee. Autumn in New York Why does it seem so inviting Autumn in New York It spells the thrill of first night Glittering crowds And shimmering clouds In canyons of steel They're making me feel I'm home It's autumn in New York That brings the promise of new love Autumn in New York is often mingled with pain. Dreamers with empty hands may sigh for exotic lands. It's autumn in New York. It's good to live it again Autumn in New York The gleaming rooftops at sundown Autumn in New York It lifts you up when you run down Gay ways and gay voices who lunch at the Ritz will tell you that it's 
turn the county funds over to him in Capital City. Good. He's a Melody Kid. <laughs> so he still wants home-cooked meals, does he? Well, this time he'll get one that'll curl his hair. Oh, no, no, shoot it. Please, please. Come on. Come on. But even when a sitcom is trying to be about something bigger like history or teen pregnancy or underage drinking, sitcoms are like people. They're self-absorbed. What they're most interested in is themselves. And when they do history, they always put their own characters at the center of the story. Mr. Ed, the talking horse, tells the tale of the pilgrim horse who saved the first Thanksgiving. And if you were under the impression that the Salem witch trials ended because rich and powerful people started getting accused of witchcraft, think again. It was Samantha. I'm bewitched. <laughs> or take that Happy Days Thanksgiving episode in which it's revealed that the person who gave us Thanksgiving was not Squanto or William Bradford, but the Fonz. That's right, the Fonz. Here's how it went down. All the pilgrims were afraid of the Indians except Pilgrim Fonzie, who was their friend. I don't want no cornbread to thieves like my last set. I don't want no cornbread to thieves like my last set. That's half a time. Lord, Lord, half a time. I got a letter, a letter from my mother this morning. I got a letter, a letter from my mother this morning. She said, come home, Lord, Lord, son, come on. Woo! All right, man. I ain't got no, got no bed but I ain't got no, got no bed I can't come home. Mother, you know your son can't come home. Woo! But if I can make, oh Lord, June, July, and all. Oh, yeah! If I can make June, July, and all. I'll come home, mother, you know your son will come home, and I heard him say, oh no, I don't want no more cornbread and peas like my last cent, I don't want no more cornbread and peas like my last 
said, I said, my time, Lord, Lord, never John. in one of Potsy's stupid beaver traps. <laughs> that Potsy. <laughs> but you know that thing Fonzie does with the jukebox where he whacks it with his fist and the music plays? Turns out that works on beaver traps too. <laughs> they open right up. But he won't free Joni until everyone renounces their racism and acts nice to the Indians and invites them to dinner. Fonzie, he's the Martin Luther King of candied yams. Mostly sitcom Puritans are rendered in the tone I like to call the boy, people used to be so stupid school of history. Bewitched produced not one, but two time travel witch trial episodes, one for each dairy. In many foreign lands, wherever wine connoisseurs gather, they enthusiastically praise the distinguished character of Roma wines. Such praise of Roma wines in foreign lands can only mean that they are truly magnificent in quality. Roma Wines' excellence is due to a unique combination of California's perfect soil and climate, from whence come the choice Roma Wine grapes, plus age-old winemaking skill and modern knowledge. These combine to make Roma constant in quality, uniformly fine, unexcelled in value. Tomorrow, discover for yourself the delightful Roma taste and goodness enjoyed by more Americans than any other wine. Simply serve as an appetizer before dinner a cool glass of golden nut-like Roma California sherry. Then on the table, place a bottle of cool, hearty Roma Burgundy. You'll be pleasantly surprised at the extra delight it adds to your meal, how it will win new compliments from family or guests. Yet, the cost is only pennies a glassful. Get Roma wines tomorrow. If your dealer is temporarily out of Roma... Please try again soon. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. So he says to me, you like pie, don't you? Don't you? Pie, pie rules. I like pie, I like pie. It rocks my scene. I like pie, I like pie. Pie, 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 pie. 
Holy crap. Holy crap. I like pie. I like pie. I like pie several times in the day except at 3.47 in the afternoon because it's stupid. <laughs> pie. Pie rules. I like pie. I like pie. It rocks my scene. I like pie. I like pie. Pie, 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 Holy crap. I like pie. Pie has almost never done me wrong, except for that one time. It licked all my stamps and stuck into my lunchbox and then didn't even mail it. <laughs> pie, pie rules. I like pie. I like pie. Rocks my scene. I like pie. I like pie. Pie, 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 pie. Holy crap. I like pie. Pie is a subject I mention on message boards. I go on and it really annoys the shmang of everybody. Except for that one guy and he likes pie and I can't blame him really because pie. Pie rules. I like pie. I like pie. It rocks my scene. I like pie. I like pie. Pie, 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 pie. Holy crap. I like pie. Pie, 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 pie. Holy crap. Holy crap. I like bye. Gobble, gobble, who let the bird in? Turkey lurkey's running in the tin. He smells the stuffing and the pumpkin pie. Oh, gobble, gobble, don't wanna die. Poor turkey, poor, poor turkey. So sorry, don't mean to be a jerky. But it's time for me to be thankful So your neck I'm gonna strangle Turkey murder It's time for the holidays Turkey murder Christmas is on its way Turkey murder Let us all celebrate Pilgrims and Indians rock, yeah! Gobble gobble, you're shaking to the core I think you dropped some giblets on the floor You're so cute like Sacagawea But I'm still gonna eat ya Poor turkey, poor, poor turkey so sorry, don't mean to be a jerky, but it's time for me to give thanks. So I gotta stab you with my shank. Turkey murder. It's time for the holidays. Turkey murder. Christmas is on its way. Turkey murder. Let us all celebrate. Pilgrims and Indians rock, yeah! Once a year we party in November, so all the folks can gather and remember how the beautiful Indians gave us some corn and kept us warm. Tribes about tolerance, straight out of Arthur Miller's The Crucible, only crappier and with magical nose crinkles. <laughs> Samantha brings a ballpoint pen with her to 17th century Salem, and the townspeople think it's an instrument of black magic, so they try her for witchcraft and want to hang her. I mean, can you believe those barbarian idiots with their cockamamie farce of a legal system locking people up for fishy reasons and putting their criminals to death? Good thing Americans put an end to all that nonsense long ago. Ah, que c'est bon, bon, prendre un verre de bière avec la cuisinière dans un petit coin noir. Ah, si c'est bon, bon, faites-le en riant, y'a pas de mal là-dedans, dans le temps du jour de l'an.
his honor, the turkey in the straw, complete with variations and all the trimmings. getting together and giving the turkey a really nice send-off. How about it, okay? sitcoms gloss over about Plymouth is the most important fact of life there, the suffering. But in 1999, there was one sitcom that tried something daring. It included all the normal sitcom characters, the wacky neighbor, the hard-to-please mother-in-law, the bumbling dad. But it also reveled in and dwelled on the grim brutality of life in colonial New England. It was set entirely in 1621 Plymouth. It was called Thanks as in Thanksgiving, as in thanks a lot. I know you never saw it, which is probably why it was canceled after six weeks, but I loved it. Thanks involved two of my favorite, but usually separate things, TV and American history coming together. 
Like, imagine if you were an avid stamp collector and you found out that CBS was about to debut its new series, CSI Philately. <laughs> You'd be psyched. Mrs. American Housewife, are you saving all your used kitchen fats and turning them into your butcher regularly? Because the Army and the Navy need them, and need them now. Every drop yields material essential to the manufacture of ammunition and medicine. Help win the war. Help shorten the war. Save kitchen fats.
even the most idealistic and cheerful character on Thanks, the dad, James Winthrop, welcomes in the spring saying, What a beautiful day it is. The snow is melting. Everyone out and about airing out their clothes, lugging out their dead. James Winthrop is surely modeled on John Winthrop, the first governor of Massachusetts and author of the famous hopeful sermon about how he and his fellow Englishmen are to be as a city upon a hill. On thanks, that sort of idealism is literally a joke. Says Winthrop, we're not the kind of people who are easily discouraged by a few snow flurries, a couple of head colds, the 50% mortality rate. No, we're pilgrims, strong-willed people who never give up. He's wrong. The only thing his fellow residents of New England want is to get the hell back to old England. making jokes out of standard sitcom ingredients. 
The funniest ongoing gag involved Abigail, your typical sitcom teenage bombshell daughter. After a disagreement with her parents about boys, she lets loose the sort of routine girl outburst that's been seen on prime time since the dawn of Gidget. I hate my life, she yells. But where a modern TV teenager would run upstairs and slam the door to her room, the 17th century teenager lives in a tiny one-room cabin, so she can only run about a foot and a half (laughs) before she throws herself face-first onto a bed right next to the table where everyone would eat if there was any food. Thanks was so refreshing because of its frankness, especially compared to earlier sitcoms. In one scene, Mrs. Winthrop meets Squanto, the famous English-speaking Indian. She asks him, what are you doing in our neck of the woods? Squanto answers, actually, we like to think of it as our neck of the woods. Sit down. Ah. I was saying that was a pork chop. Hmm, that's funny. (laughs) I laugh. (laughs) Wow. I'll tell you about it. Well, you see, when water begins to seep in the hole, you pull your cork pipe. Then you let down the shoe inside the cork chop, and you plug up the bottom of the hole, casing and all, with quick hardening cork chops. Then when it's hard, the cork chop at the bottom keeps the water out. Funny about that water. Well, we had the cork pipe all pulled and cracked, waiting for it to harden. Yeah, I hope so. Well, you see, uh, a cork pipe is hollow. And as the pork pipe digs down, it stuffs the pork chops up inside it. So when you pull it out, you got a sample of the pork chops. Oughtn't to be any at that level, according to my figuring. Oh, I don't know. Where's everybody? They all went to town. I'm the whole pork chop. <laughs> Wait a minute, Porky. Well, what did... Listen. Uh... What's eating you? Doggone it, I... I hate to be a pork chop, but I can't help it. Honest? Stupid, ain't it? Now I know how you feel, Billy. Everybody's made out of pork chops. Uh, I guess so. Yikes! And look at this. And I did look. And what he was holding was a pork chop. And there wasn't any kidding about it. It was real. see the Indians. Indians? Do you guys know what you're supposed to do? We attack the fort. Yeah, attack the fort. No, you're friendly Indians. You come in peace. We don't attack? No, no, Alice. Couldn't we attack the fort and then make friends? Greg does not want an attack. Then what do you need Indians for? Dad. Bobby, the Indians were friendly at first. They didn't start fighting until their land was taken away. You mean the pilgrims took away all the Indians' land? That's right. Uh, well, at first, they didn't take much of it. Then how about not much of an attack? (laughs) There's no attack. Alice, when they first come over, you don't know whether they're friendly or not until they hold up the friendly sign. Check, check. And then I duck out and make my change while the rest of the pilgrims greet them. That's it. Great. Okay, places, everyone. Mom, mom, over here. Yeah, the butter. You'll be with the butter, right. And and up and down, turning. And, Dad, you're chopping the wood. And try not to look too conspicuous, okay? (laughs) Okay. Everybody ready? And, uh, action! All right, now now you see the Indians. Now you see they're friendly. Come on, Indians, come on. Help! Help! Me Somerset! Me Squanto! Well, I say, I'm awfully glad to see you. Governor John Carver here. Pilgrim! (laughs) Well, I say, everyone, they're friendly Indians. Bring them beads oh. and trinkets. Oh, how oh, friendly oh. Indians. Oh, how. Oh, how. Oh, nice feathers. Aren't they nice Indians? Oh, and Oh, I say, look at all the friendly Indians. <laughs> Invented poutine. It was 
was the most peculiar scene. Jeanette Renault was shy and thin. The Nordiques began to win. Jacques Parousseau sang, God save the Queen. The night they Precise origin, where or when this food did begin. Everybody in Quebec will tell you with a grin. It was their little village that invented the poutine. To be really authentic, the potato must be old, the gravy must be hot, and the cheese must be cold. With a sure now the Montreal wherever it's sold, served with a roll in a bowl by a troll. You put some potatoes and some cheese in, till the cheese won't melt till you put the gravy in. Then it sticks to your fork and it dribbles down your chin. And that's how you know that you're eating a poutine. If the French fries are greasy and the gravy's nice and hot, the cheese curds melt as they come out of the pot. But once in your stomach, they can chill into a knot. If the food does that, poutine is what you got. Well, there's no way anyone would call it au cuisine. It isn't really junk food, it's something in between. But it's better than a burger or a Mike submarine. A balanced diet is a beer and a poutine. pretty much the whole story right there. It's so quick and clean and concise. Plymouth was actually built on the site of Squanto's hometown, Patuxet. All his friends and family, his whole village, died from the diseases that arrived with earlier European visitors. Squanto is hanging around because it's the only home he knows. That's why he's there to help the incompetent white people grow corn, using the seeds they'd stolen from some other Indians on Cape Cod. We like to think of it as our neck of the woods. There's so much meaning in that one little wisecrack. It shows you history doesn't have to be trampled by the sitcom format. Here's another example. There's a Cracker Jack Thanksgiving dinner scene in the Pilgrim episode of The Simpsons. Ned Flanders, playing the purest of all the Puritans, is talking to Indian Chief Wiggum. Get it? <laughs> and Flanders says... Chief Wiggum, we could never have survived our first year in the New World without you. I almost regret what we Europeans are going to do to you. (laughs) Chief Wiggum, what are you going to do? Flanders, oh, give you the biggest slice of pumpkin pie. Also, we're going to take your land and wipe you out. Who wants whipped topping? Okay, are we ready? We sure are. Uh, Peter, get the lights. Hurry up. And now, kids, please don't get in front of the screen, okay? Now, over everything. You can't have a movie without... Oh, Alan, you think of everything. Sure. Did you solve it? Come on, Pam, hurry up. Yes, Bobby, sit down. Yeah, stay in your chairs. Bobby. I'm sorry. Here we go. Where did you hear the narration of music I recorded? September the 16th in the year 1620 that the Pilgrims set sail from England for Virginia. Say, that was pretty good. Yeah, that was real. But they missed Virginia because in the middle of the Atlantic they ran into storms. Oh! Oh. Quite this happened to the Pilgrims. (laughs) But they persevered and sailed on. And finally they made it to the New World. And on a stormy day they first set foot on Plymouth Rock. December came and it was very cold. Why are we walking so funny? It's slow motion. I think that's very effective, you know that? I put in some special effects, like in those real arty movies. And they didn't have much shelter, so they got sick. (laughs) Oh, would you say I overacted a little? (laughs) Oh, well, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Honey, you're my favorite ham. <laughs> <laughs> then came a terrible snowstorm. Just call me quiver lips. I'm quivering right back at you. <laughs> <laughs> even 
sicker. And sicker. And sicker. And sicker. And sicker. Finally, spring came. And so did the Indians. And so did the Indians. Oh. Yep. Squano and Samoset. Yep. Dear. Ow, ow. Dear. The Indians amazed the pilgrims by speaking some English. And the pilgrims made friends with the Indians and invited them to a feast. Look that Alice, you know what? I think I like you better. Miss oh. Alice. <laughs> First, they gave thanks for safely reaching the new world. Then they ate. <laughs> and ate. And ate. And ate. And ate. And ate. You look like Henry VIII. <laughs> <laughs> I ate enough turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Then one day, it was time for the Mayflower to sail back to England. <laughs> Captain Jones asked the pilgrims who had survived if any wanted to go back with him. <laughs> Not one of them did. He reminded them of the storms and the Indians. They wouldn't go. So he split. <laughs> and the Mayflower sailed, leaving the pilgrims to build a new country. Which they did. That groovy history teacher gave me an A for the movie. Congratulations, that's great. Yeah, she must have liked it, huh? Well, she didn't think it was a great movie, but she sure thought I showed how tough it was to be a pilgrim. <laughs> are you, uh, are, are you, you're bummed about this Thanksgiving thing? I am a little bit bummed, yeah. I mean, I, I really like Thanksgiving, mainly because of the food, um, and I would travel as far as I possibly could to be at home, because we have some really great recipes at our house, and I'm like a little bit sad. To like what recipes, what do you? Well, there's one particular food that I'm really fond of, Thanksgiving food. I, I would love to sing about it, if that's okay with you. I mean, go for it. Can I, can I borrow the roots, is that cool? Sit quietly next to the others Cornbread, turkey, mashed potatoes with butter I gently hear you call my name Rashida. From under some gravy <laughs> And I wonder if you know that all I want Is to be a lady I will enjoy you all night long yeah. Seconds, thirds, and fourths Till the break of dawn yeah. Baby, the best part is It always wins I take you home with me I hate you up We do it all over again Cause I love stuff 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 I love stuffing Stuffing I love stuffing Stuffing, more stuffing, please. This ain't about nothing but some stuffing. Just say the word and you can stuff my bird. Uh, go, go, go.
stuffing. Ain't nothing but some stuffing. Flanders isn't embarrassed about the harsh story of America. If anything, he's cheerful. And there's something sort of profound about that combination. In fact, the greatest sitcom characters, which is to say the funniest and the most riveting to watch, are cheerful at the same time that they're self-absorbed and galling and oblivious to the destruction left in their wake. Think Homer Simpson, Michael Scott on The Office, Ted Baxter from Mary Tyler Moore, Larry David, the entire cast of Seinfeld. (laughs) And you know what else is like that? The United States of America. I don't know why you would applaud that. (laughs) That's why it doesn't really matter if these Pilgrim episodes are factually accurate, because sitcoms tell the true story of our nation every time the Michaels and Homers and Larrys open their mouths. We're well-meaning, lovable, unintentionally destructive, believing we're more important than we are, like we're some kind of city upon a hill. Thank you. Yes, I know, I've been slacking off from this, which was supposed to be my slack. Just let me say, I've been really sick for a really long time. Since my last podcast, I've been in the hospital twice, once over in Seattle for robot surgery, to remove my lady system, PM. I have been red blood cell challenged until now. Listen to me. Well... I'm still actually challenged, but not at death's door. I swear the ancients had it right about blood. It's all about the blood. Blood is life. I have no idea how it got to bloodletting from that. You know, you have little blood, you got little oxygen to the brain. Basically, I've been an idiot all this time and unable to do the podcast. But here I am now. I have lots of other files free for download, which is obvious judging by the number of this podcast. You can download them at mondodiablo.wordpress.com. Also, my new Facebook name is my real name, which is Allison Randall. A-L-I-S-O-N-R-A-N-D-A-L-L. See you in December.
Yeah, going for a ride now.